Good evening, Captain Retired Matt Edwards here on the 12th of May, 2022. I might try to keep this one really short because I noticed my phone, which I use to record these videos and go live, is down to 6% uh, charge. So, it might cut off, I don't know, so maybe in order to try to keep it short, you know, to not lose my time slot, sort of. <laughs> Anyway, as I post it to my observation post, actually I tried something different this time. I posted it to my own page and then I shared it to observation post. Whereas normally I put it into the observation post and then share it to my main page. Mm -hmm. yeah, tomato, tomato. But anyway, let's see if it uh, gets some more attention. Duress. It voids whatever pressure the pressure to sign wants to obtain. So if you put a gun to someone's head, make them do something, it usually, you know, is not going to end well. So if someone makes you sign something, like the Canada Pension Plan, they want you to get it in order for them to save money, and they put pressure on you by saying that they will estimate their Canada Pension Plan and deduct the amount anyway, well, that's duress. So even if you sign it, it doesn't mean spit. TPI. Now... <clears throat> this is what they call diminished earnings capacity now, but it started out in 2006 as the Totally and Permanently Incapacitated. Now, they had that name, diminished earnings capacity, available back in 2006, but they chose to call it the, you know, Totally and Permanently Incapacitated. There was no need, in my opinion, to change the name. Now, <clears throat> I said there's TPI duplication. Veterans Affairs Canada used to certify uh, TPI each year and then moved every two years. But the real question is, can they? What I meant by that is that the program arrangement between the Department of National Defense, Service Income Support Insurance Plan, and Veterans Affairs Canada, that integrates these two programs allegedly. That's not the way it's supposed to work. They are different animals. You have one that compensate you, you for your injury in replacement for a lawsuit in tort. That will be the income replacement benefit, which started out as the earnings loss benefit. But service income support insurance plan is a non-indemnity and contributory insurance that they forced us to buy in 1982 when they passed Queen's Regulations and Orders 208.53 and they made it so that you had no choice. Before that, you had a choice. You could say, no, I don't want to buy that insurance, or yes, I do want to buy that insurance. But after 1982, they took away the freedom to contract. Pensions. Pensions are widely misunderstood. I don't think I'm telling you anything new here. In fact, the government didn't help by making a Pension Act pension, which is for disability and compensation for that disability. I don't know what they could have called it, but calling it a pension, when a lot of people think of a pension as a retirement pension. So a retirement pension is when you save up money for your retirement. So you have money deducted from your pay, or your employer pays it into the bank, for you to have after your retirement. But people seem to think that pensions are income when they're not. They're legally property. So because they're property, you own them. Now, many cases have been heard about this, and you might not own them legally, but you own them equitably, beneficially. You own them, the employer might legally own them because somebody has to own the thing, but it's held for the pensioner's benefit. Now, this is what the government is screwing us over on, because it, it says that the taxpayer has an interest in our retirement pensions. Nothing could be further from the truth. Basically, they're saying that they pay us too much whenever they claw something back. So if they pay you the Canada Pension Plan and then pay you the Canadian Forces Pension, according to them, they have the right to make a law that claws it back. Now, they call it bridging, but it's a clawback. The thing is, though, they are both legally your property. So why can't you get both of them? 
Now, in the case of the disabled uh, contributor for the Canada Pension Plan, that's where the duress comes in. I know cases such as myself, Sun Life forced me to apply for Canada Pension Plan three times. I know of Denis Ouellette, Captain Retired. He lives in Coal Lake, Alberta now. Well, he might be from there originally. But anyway, uh, they tried to force him to apply, <clears throat> and he wasn't legally able to get it. Now, I'm getting ahead of myself. I think I wrote this down as a note for a later show because I've been listing everything in, my, in a document called Draft Ideas. But <clears throat> the Canada Pension Plan is a law. Now, the Canada Pension Plan Act states that you had to have four out of six years with recent contributions in order to qualify. Now, that means you're expected to know that law, and the government wrote it, so they should know it. So, if Manulife sent a letter to Denis in 2016, and they said, listen, we want you to apply for the Canada Pension Plan Disability. Now, he got out in 2004. He served from 1978 to 2004, 26 years. He was an AWACS, I don't know, coordination officer or something, whatever. He was an officer on board an AWACS. So they wanted him to apply for something that he couldn't legally get. Now recently, today, I thought, I wonder if this is a criminal conspiracy. They want people to apply to get something they can't legally get. And why I said it might be a criminal conspiracy is that a conspiracy is when two or more people agree to do something illegal. Now, you are required to have four out of six years, but Service Canada has been approving people like myself who didn't have four out of six years. So, is there a criminal conspiracy on the part of the insurance companies and Service Canada in which they approve people who shouldn't be approved so that they can save money? don't know the answer. I know what I suspect. I was told by a veteran that someone, a case manager at Veterans Affairs, told him to get Canada Pension Plan Disability. He said, I don't qualify. Oh, don't worry about it. We have an arrangement with, with Service Canada. Now, that sounds like a criminal conspiracy as well. They want people to apply even though they can't legally get it. One of these days, someone could go to jail for that. Now, uh, don't get me wrong. I don't think the government's going to be too keen on sending themselves to jail for breaking the laws that they wrote. But they should go to jail, or they should get a slap on the wrist, or they should fucking stop doing it. Now, <clears throat> misinformation, disinformation, and propaganda. There's been a lot of talk about that, about the Ukraine war. Okay? So, I hear a lot about disinformation and misinformation. I had to look it up. So, disinformation is like if you want to mislead the enemy. Like it's a tactic, deception. So you plant evidence, you make them think you're going to do one thing. You want them to be in disarray. Misinformation is when you are mistaken about something, but you present it to someone as the truth. So the government's always telling us that pensions are income. That, to me, is probably misinformation. They want it to be income. They tell us it's income. And the bottom line for getting back to what I was saying before about the bridging is that they think that we're getting paid too much. So because they think that we're getting paid too much, that we haven't earned it, in 2012, Prime Minister Harper passed the law to say that Canadian Forces members will pay 50% of the pension contribution. But it's a defined benefit pension. What you get out of a defined benefit pension, it doesn't matter how much you contribute. You could contribute zero, one cent, or a million dollars, but you're going to get a pension based on a formula in either a contract or a law. So Harper, in 2012, staged a big robbery, a huge robbery, because he convinced people I mean, people probably told him, the experts in pensions and stuff, they probably told him that, that this pension is too generous. Because I heard that word a lot, and it kind of triggers me. According to the Roy Federal Court of Appeal 2003 case, the Canadian Forces Superannuation Act is both a forced savings plan and an incentive 
to join the military. So they want people to join the military. They want people to stay in the military so they have a pension to attract people and retain them. Now, according to people like Harper, they don't really want people to join the military. If they're going to raise the cost, that's going to reduce the incentive. It's counterproductive, it's bad public policy, and it's illegal because pensions are property. You shouldn't have to contribute to a pension. You sh your service should be enough. Now, <clears throat> next one, I'm flying along because I want to be done quick. What is IRB, Income Replacement Benefit, legally? Is it compensation for an injury? Is it welfare? Is it income? Is it a fringe benefit? Is it a pension? Because in 2017, uh, my member of parliament, Seamus O'Regan, brought in this stupid pension for life bullshit. So, it, it, what is it? Okay, Because we have a right to know. We should know what we're going to get if they approve us for this crap. Now, why do I call it crap? Because they based it on the Service Income Support Insurance Plan, which then meant it had clawbacks. It had a 2% cap on the cost of living allowance. They removed the cap on the cost of living in 2016. Uh, it has all these different clawbacks, including the Pension Act between 2006 and 2012. Now, is it a pension? No, I wouldn't call it a pension. What recently I thought of, it might be considered a structured settlement, okay? If you went to court, if someone injured you, you could get damages for if you win the case. If someone had a duty of care owed to you, they breached that duty of care, and there was resulting damages. There was a monetary cost to their negligence. Well, sometimes you get a lump sum, and sometimes you get a structured settlement. So the structure settlement has the damages paid out over time. So the Pension Act could be looked at as a structure settlement, and so could the income replacement benefit. Now people might say, who cares? Well, if someone challenged this, me or someone else, well, I don't get income replacement benefits, so I doubt it would be me. I think it would make it tax-free, because structured settlements are tax-free. So nobody really knows, as far as I'm concerned, what is the legal nature of the income replacement benefit? People might say it's income because it has a name in it, but it's not really income because it has an extra two words. Income replacement benefit. Well, it's not income because it doesn't increase your will. It doesn't replace income because, while well, your income increases over time and it is stuck at 90% without any promotion and seniority increases because people rise in rank and people like if you're a captain you have 10 incentive pay grades uh, categories IPCs so that's what the old permanent impairment allowance was supposed to compensate you for is if you were too disabled to work after two years you're supposed to be considered totally and permanently incapacitated the uh, second issue I was bringing up today's broadcast and then you will be entitled to income replacement benefit, as they call it now, until age 65 to compensate you for loss of promotion and, uh, you know, for lack of uh, ability to work. But the TPI cl category <coughs> classification would have given you the grade 3, 2, or 1 permanent impairment allowance. Now, in uh, <coughs> 2011, the conservative government brought in Bill C-55, and they added the Permanent Impairment Allowance Supplement, which was a lifetime payment of $1,000. Now, <clears throat> the Permanent Impairment Allowance is also a lifetime payment. So they brought in the payment of $500, $1,000, and $1,500 a month for anybody who was getting income replacement benefit for more than two years. But they didn't pay it out that way. So what they did was, it seems like in many case managers' minds, is that they thought it was a replacement for the in exceptional incapacity allowance, which is only paid to 98% or higher 
uh, veterans under the table of disabilities. So many case managers thought that it was a, a slight expansion of going down to 78%, right? So the old one was 98%, 99 and 100, and the new one was 78 up to 100. But in reality, it was based on your ability to work. Because according to the regulations, the Canadian Forces Members and Veterans Reestablishment Act and Compensation Act, the regulations stated you were TPI if you couldn't perform a job that was equal to 66.67% of your former trade, your former rank-based salary. So everything was based on the fact, could they make a determination? <clears throat> and I don't know how they did it. And I don't know how they do it now, and I don't know how CISA does it. I think they use a magic eight ball, or they flip a coin, or something like that. Because you take my cousin, he uh, got kicked out of a CISA because they said he was too not too disabled to work after two years, but Veterans Affairs said he was diminished earnings capacity and continued paying him income replacement benefits. Now these programs are supposed to work together. So what gives in that situation? See, everything they tell us is misinformation, disinformation, lies. They're cheating us. Because you take the Service Income Support Insurance Fund. Veterans Affairs Canada failed to put into the law that they would claw back the insurance from the Department of National Defense. But they claw it back regardless of the fact that they didn't put a law into place, despite they have them having the ability to put that law in there if they so chose. So what they did do, to the best of my knowledge, was in 2012, around the time of Dennis Minow's class action uh, victory, on the 18th of May, the Director General Policy put out a policy that they said they prescribed CISIP to be a clawback for the earnings loss benefit. Now, <clears throat> policy isn't law. Regulations are law. Regulations are subordinate law under an act. So the act has more power than a regulation, but you know how much legal power a policy has? Fuck all. It has no power. No power. So a law can compel people to do things. Regulatory law or statutory law. Common law probably as well. But they don't have a law to take CISIP into account, but they take CISIP into account anyway. Now that is the act of a dictator. Okay, right now we have Putin in Russia trying to take over Ukraine. Now I'm firmly behind the Ukrainians. When you have a democratic country being invaded by a dictatorship and they call them Nazis when the president of the Ukraine is a Jew. So what kind of bullshit disinformation are these pricks trying to do? They thought they'd just roll right into Kiev and take it and have the war over in two or three days. Now, I saw a story because I'm kind of looking up YouTube videos a lot. I enjoyed watching Russians getting killed. Now, don't think I'm sick, but I was in the military for 13 years and, I, and they were the enemy. So when I see them invade somebody... I'm happy to see them getting fucking blasted. So, they have 130 bodies of unidentified Russians in Kiev. And they had to put them in cold storage because the Russians won't take their own dead soldiers back. Now, that is disgusting. You should, even if you shouldn't have invaded them, you shouldn't leave your troops, your dead soldiers, in a foreign nation and refuse to take them back when the Ukrainians are wanting to give them back to them and let them at least, you know, do the right thing or something. So that, I was kind of shocked when I saw that story. Like, you might not believe it because it sounds so crazy, but nothing the Russians do shocks me anymore. These people are not human. They don't have any human compassion, empathy. They don't. I saw a video today, a car dealership. The buddy who owned the place had a guard he hired, and they went out and had a cigarette with the Russian soldiers, and they were walking away, and they shot him in the back. Killed both of them people who they just had bummed the smoke off of. That is evil, okay? These people are committing war crimes. That's all there is to it.
They have no control over their military. They're like a rabble, right? Anyway, getting off the topic. What happens if a veteran refuses to sign a condition of benefits agreement? Can the government hold anyone to the agreement? And then I put the answer, no. The agreement purports that it is Manulife, not the Crown. You see, this is what eventually would cause us to get success, a victory. Okay, So these people, they want to steal our property. Now, they want to steal our property, but they are pretending they are Manulife. It is really the same government who we serve. Now, the same government who we became disabled serving is using Manulife to hide their actions. And they're basically the employer wants to save money at the expense of the disabled employee. Now, how can you call that anything but evil? Okay. So instead of taking you out and shooting you and killing you and, and having you, you know, mercy, mercy killing or something, they want us to die of starvation by stealing our money. Because I was thinking about it recently. Take Sean Corrine, okay, leading seaman retired. I went over to the Member of Parliament's office in 2018. We explained, me and Sean, that the Canada Pension Plan disability was being deducted at both CISIP and Veterans Affairs. Later, we realized it was actually three places it was being taken into account because the Canada Pension Plan was first coming off of the Canadian Forces Superannuation Act Pension. Secondly, it was coming off the Service Income Support Insurance Plan. And thirdly, it was coming off the Income Replacement Benefit. So for four years, the government has been acting, taking the money, even though they ought to have known better. You can't deduct the value of something if another department already used up the value in their accounting system. It's insane. But they haven't tried even to fix it. Okay? So what are they doing? I made an estimate, and I kind of pride myself on my math skills and analytical skills. I looked at how many people I knew of that I had stats on. I looked at the number of people reported in the CBC story who got an extra payment in October of 2016. And the number was uh, 5,300 or something, I think. I then got the average of the few people I had the statistics on, multiply, multiplied it by the number of people in that CBC story, and I put a high end and a low end on it. And I estimated it would be between $420 million to 480 to $920 million. Now, that was between 2016 and 2018. So there has been four years additional damages that have gone on top of that. And nobody's doing anything to fix it. Now, I could be wrong because I'm working with limited information. It could be higher. It could be lower. But no one should think that they can do it simply because they say they can. So the Canadian Forces Superannuation Act people, they say, well, we have the bridging section in the Act. The CISA people, they say, well, we have the clawback, the reduction, the offset in the contract. The Veterans Affairs people, they say, well, we have a, a deduction, a reduction, a clawback, whatever you want to call it, in the regulations under the new Veterans Charter. But you can't apply all three and ignore the other two. So I believe this is going to what's going to, this is the thing that's going to sink their boat. You cannot do what the private insurance industry doesn't do. In my case, for example, Sun Life took my Canada Pension Plan into account early in March 2014. Manulife, they took it into account around. 2015. And the Canadian Forces Pension and the Public Service Pension took it into account as well. So I lost money from four different things. Because I got the Canada Pension Plan Disability, which don't forget, I got it illegally. I didn't know that I didn't have the contributions to get it, you know, that I failed to have it until I got a letter. The letter was dated the 26th of July, 2013. But I never opened that letter because, as many of us have this brown envelope syndrome, I threw it in the corner. 
when I finally opened it in 2016, I had already been approved. And, well, I mean, nobody was going to do anything about it. I sent a letter to the uh, Minister of Canada Pension Plan, and I hand-delivered it to the office here in 2019. Never heard a word back. See, I think they know they're going to get caught if, you know, stories like mine come out. Now, <clears throat> many life, I told them to piss up a rope, okay? They want me to share the Canada Pension Plan with between Sun Life and them, they wanted both companies to take 50% each. Now, I had found out about another uh, soldier, uh, captain up in Edmonton, uh, Nelson Peters. And he told me that they were only taking it into account once, and it was Manulife taking 100%, and Sun Life said that was okay. It averaged out to 50. Now, I said to Manulife, you should do the exact opposite with me. Sun Life is taking 100% of it into account, They've been doing it since March 2014. I told them first, the early bird gets sore and fuck out. But they refused to do that. Okay? So they sent me a letter and they said, well, here we have an example of some veterans who are getting 50% at each place. So I said to my wife last night, she doesn't like to hear this stuff, but I said, you know, I think I've been neglecting all of this veteran stuff recently. All I'm doing is this Facebook Live. I'm not doing any posts. I'm not going to talk to anybody. I'm not calling any members of Parliament. I have to get back at it sooner or later. But I said, what occurred to me about this Canada Pension Plan is you have three different examples. You have my case, where the Sun Life is taking 100, Manual Life wants 50-50. You have Nelson's case, where Sun Life said it was okay to not take any, and Manual Life took 100%. And in the letter from Manulife, they said they have a case where it's 50-50. Now, that's too confusing. You can't have three different situations. You know, I mean, it's crazy. So, I, it reminded me of a case, i got to look up the exact name, but there was a case called Lombard or something, and it was talking about this very same thing. And the judge said, well, what about if this company goes out of business? What about if he dies? What about if this happens? And what about if that happens? Because... By splitting it 50-50, you're complicating, you're doubling the administration, okay? If you're getting a payment, and Canada Pension Plan is, and you're getting Sun Life, like in my case, and then Sun Life takes my Canada Pension Plan, and let's pretend it's legal. It's not. Well, that's one person, one entity doing it, and that's it. But now if you have Manual Life come along, and they want to take their share into account, now you have two companies doing it. Now both companies are doing it on behalf of the government of Canada. Now ordinarily, if you bought insurance on your own and you went into Manual Life or Sun Life's office, you'd be buying it from a private insurer. But in the government's case for the federal long-term disability plans, these are self-insured policies. And the government only hired these companies to do the administration, to do the paperwork. They had the expertise, so they hired them to do it. It would be cheaper, they figured. But you're lying to the people. You're, you're fabricating things. When you say that it's Manulife who underwrites and insures the policy, when in fact, according to the Dennis Manoj case, it's the government of Canada, because he sued the government, not Manulife. So the thing is, is nobody likes to be lied to. Okay, We're in a democracy. They're supposed to not lie to us. They might put a bit of spin on something, and you can understand that if they have wiggle room. But when a case has been at trial, after the case is over, there's a thing called a judicial fact. No one can argue with a judicial fact. Can't help it, I was about to shut up, but I'll mention this one other thing. My member of Parliament said to me once, and kind of drove me nuts, he said laws are open to interpretation when I was telling them it's against the law for the government to take, say, the Canadian Forces Superannuation Act pension into account under CISIP or income replacement benefit because the government in the past wrote Canadian Forces Superannuation Act Section 83 and forbade it. He looked at me and said, well, the law is open to interpretation. Well, see, a lawmaker shouldn't be telling that to anyone because they're the people who write laws. If the government writes laws that are open to interpretation, they're not doing their job. 
because then that law is suspect and can be struck down. Laws are supposed to be clear enough to be understood and obeyed. That's the way it's supposed to work. But according to the government, they put this out there as if it makes sense. Laws are open to interpretation. Well, see, I had come across this once before, and I looked it up. You know who interprets laws? Judges. Now, last point, and as I said that, I was, you know, I realized I'm kind of breaking my own word to shut up. The Dennis Manu's class action wasn't about the interpretation of what the Pension Act was about. Everybody is, you know, thinks that the pension is uh, for pain and suffering when it's not. If that had been a case solely about what is the Pension Act, is it meant to compensate a person for their injury to make them whole in replacement for a lawsuit in tort? Or is it a pain and suffering award? Well, that would have been one thing, but it was a contract action about the ability of the Department of National Defense to save money by taking the Veterans Affairs payment into account to reduce money, to reduce taxes, for the citizens of Canada. Because if they had to pay both, then they had to pay more taxes. So you'll find a lot of this stuff comes down to money. And I wish to hell I didn't have this mind whirling around because Canada sent howitzers to Ukraine and they sent them Excalibur GPS guided rounds. Now, I don't have a problem with that, but you know what? I think the government was glad to get rid of, of those nasty things that they bought when we were in Afghanistan. And the first chance they had like this, they got rid of them. But, you know, we need weapons because we have a military to defend us. So we can't just give it all away. Hopefully, they will have to buy new stuff to replace what they gave to the Ukrainians. And I hope they do more if that's what they're doing. But if they're simply getting rid of those nasty weapons because many people in Canada think war is bad. So, therefore, weapons of war are bad. Therefore, soldiers who wage war are bad. Therefore, veterans who get disabled fighting wars are bad. That's one of my theories. One of my theories is that the government treats us like shit because of that unconscious bias against war. No one likes war, but war is sometimes inevitable. On that note, I'm fairly short tonight, hopefully, and uh, uh, hopefully, you know, I'm not too boring. Uh, and I'm planning on going to the MP's office, either protesting or trying to make an unannounced visit because they haven't got back to me. I asked for a an appointment. I never heard a word back, and I think the COVID restrictions are over. So why are they dragging their heels about setting up an appointment for me to go in and talk to them? And I can bring up something like, you know, I bought back my time when I was on leave without pay. So for three years, I was on Sun Life Insurance while I worked for CRA. And when I finished, I had to buy back my time because that's the deal in the leave without pay policy. But you know, Sun Life took my increased pension into account. So my purchase of my pension property didn't do me any fucking good. Now, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to help me get that fixed? I don't expect any results. I'm just going to put them on the spot. Because I don't think it's just me. Because that's a treasury board policy. And I think there are 20,000 disabled people on that Sun Life policy. So I suspect that there are many people who buy back their pensions. Buy back their leave without pay time. And then don't receive any benefit from it. Now a simple estimate of how much money is. Is that 2% a year accrual rate times 3 years is 6%. So 6% of my, my pension that is the amount of the money that I paid for, for nothing, because my cash purchase ended up reducing the payment I got on my long-term disability. That's not how things are supposed to work. Now, they never thought about it. Why am I thinking about it? But that could be a tort, maybe, negligence. It could be some kind of equitable uh, remedy, like uh, unjust enrichment. I paid for an increased pension so that I would get more money per month. I didn't pay more money to reduce my long-term disability and have the taxpayer save. Like the Pension Act clawback, 
you know, save money for the taxpayers, well, my leave without pay purchase only benefited the government. Okay, I'll, I'll be here all night if I keep this up, so have a good weekend and stay safe.